Hi, it's Dennis Daly, inviting you to sit back and relax and listen to another edition of the Sunday Detective Theater. The history of detective shows on radio goes back to almost the very beginning. There were episodes of Sherlock Holmes, for example, as early as the 1920s. But as radio progressed and got better, the detectives became more sophisticated. On this show, we'll go back into the archives and listen to some of the greatest radio detectives of all time. And this time around, we focus in on the great series, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, from the mid-1950s. It was a daily show, a daily 15-minute show. We've taken a week's worth and put them into one one-hour, kind of luxe radio theater version. Now enjoy. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Don Hancock, Johnny. Surety Mutual. Hi, Don. What's on your mind? Qui bono. Qui who? It's Latin, kiddo. Qui bono. Who benefits? All right, I'll bite. Who does? A little doll named Lou Ann Parker down in Green Pass, Virginia. Seems little old Magnolia Blossom thought Papa was a prowler. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Johnny. Double indemnity. She's the gal what done it. She admits it. But the coroner is about to call it an unavoidable accident. Qui bono. So? I think you'd better put yourself on the payroll. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Qui Bono matter. Item 1, $78.45. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greenpass. Which was a village of some 12,000 people, hidden among quiet wooded hills. And located, as I discovered on arrival, some three miles from the railroad station. Nice weather we're having. Yeah, it's fine. You from New York? Well, near there, Hartford. Bet you ain't been having weather like this up there. No, no, it's been pretty cold. You say your name was Dollar? Yeah, Johnny Dollar. I'm Jake Deagley. You here on business? That's right. Well, I wouldn't count on finding much here. Green Pass is what you might call a one-horse town. One hotel, one bank, one taxi, that's me, one newspaper. And one county attorney. Yep, just one... Oh, and you've heard about our tragedy, about Dan Parker getting shot. Yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm an investigator for an insurance company. I see. Well, it was a terrible thing. It was... Oh, darn it, darn it. If old man Hawley don't fix up them fences, he's going to be short a cow one of these days. That's the third time this week they've been out the road. How do people around here feel about Dan Parker? Was he well-liked? Well, he'd been re-elected for five straight terms. No personal enemies? Not a one. There ain't a man in green past. That... Hey, what difference does it make whether he was well liked? You know how he was killed, don't you? Yeah, I understand he was shot accidentally by his stepdaughter. That's right. And what difference does it make whether he had any enemies? Well, none, probably. But when an insurance company holds a policy as large as the one they carried on Dan Parker, they want to know the full circumstances surrounding the death. Well, there ain't no mystery about it, Mr. Dollar. That poor girl took him for a burglar and shot him, that's all. And it might have near broke her up. Say, what about her, Jake? Is she well-liked? Well, let me put it this way. I'm 52 years old. I got a grandson, 17. And we're both in love with Lou Ann Parker. I see. And there's 5,000 other males in Green Pass that feel the same way. She get along all right with her stepfather? They worshipped each other. She was all Dan had since Mrs. Parker died nine years ago. They were thicker than thieves, them two. Rode horseback together, went fishing, took trips together... Well, then it's understandable that she'd be pretty broken up. It was terrible for her. She went clean out of her mind when she realized what she'd done. So tell me, was Dan Parker a wealthy man? No. Fairly well to do for these parts, but no way as wealthy the way you'd think of it in New York, for instance. Then I imagine the Parker girl would think of $100,000 as being a pretty sizable fortune. Mr. Dollar, let me give you a little advice. Oh? Uh-huh. You got a job to do, fine. But if I was you, I'd be mighty careful how I went about doing it. Why so? 
Well, people up here in the hills are kind of standoffish at best. And if you go around hitting what you seem to be hitting at, dig easy. Jake Digley's one-man taxi service dropped me off at the town's one-man hotel. I signed in, left my bags, and did a quick resume of the case which Don Hancock had given me in New York. I tried pumping the hotel proprietor, but when he found out who I was, he frosted up like a mint julep on a sultry day. But he did tell me I could find the sheriff across the square at the town's one pool room. It turned out to be a one-man place, too. And at the moment, Sheriff Jim Peterson was the one man. Well, oh, glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, just thinking now. Uh, watch me get that there three ball down there. <laughs> Good shot. No, that was a setup. You couldn't miss one like that if you wanted to. Uh, got something on your mind, sir? Yes. I'm an insurance investigator. I'm here in connection with the Parker case. I'll well, see. Go. Oh, Go ahead. Well, I don't think I'd call it a case exactly. It was an accident. Ain't no mystery about it, as far as I can see. I didn't mean to imply that there was, Sheriff. As it stands now, this is a routine investigation, nothing more. I just like to get the facts, find out exactly what happened, in order to furnish my company with a report they need to pay the claim. I'd uh, appreciate your cooperation if you've got the time. Oh, I got the time, all right, sir. Well, uh, how much you know about it? Well, uh, not much. Dan Parker, as I understand it, was your county attorney here. His stepdaughter, Luann Parker, who is the beneficiary under our policy, mistook him for a prowler, shot him, and killed him. Oh, that's about it. Uh, well, a thing happened three nights ago. Dan had been up to Richmond on business. He'd come back in on a midnight train. He walked down from the station. Walked? Three miles at that time of night? Well, it's a little over two to his place. It's outside of town a ways. Well, that's still quite a walk. Why didn't he call this uh, taxi driver, Jake Digley? Yeah, well, he probably did try to, but Jake wasn't expecting any business, so he took a night off. He was out at Happy Hollow. See, that's a kind of a roadhouse about five miles up the highway. Does Dan's daughter have a car? Yeah, she does. But I figure he didn't want to bother her at that time of night. See, he wasn't due in till the next afternoon. But it appears like he finished up his business and decided to come on back at night without letting Lou Ann know or anybody else. Now, let me see here. Was he in the habit of coming back unexpectedly from trips? Mm, no, I wouldn't say he was. Well, go on. Huh? Oh, well, uh, Dan didn't take many trips. And when he did, he most always made arrangements with Jake or Lou Ann to meet him at the station. I see. So, anyway, he walked home that night and he took a shortcut through the lane and come on in the back way across the terrace. And right there was his fatal act. Oh, what do you mean? He bumped against the lawn chair. The sound woke up Lou Ann. And then she heard him fumbling with the lock of the back door and heard him come on in the house. She took a thirty-eight pistol from a drawer of her night table and went to the head of the stairs. When she heard him start up, she fired twice and killed him. Mm -hmm. Were there any lights on in the house? No, she was afraid to turn on any light. And I reckon Dan was trying to keep from waking her up. Two shots, two bullets in the heart, firing down a stairway in pitch darkness. That's pretty good shooting, Sheriff. Oh, well, she can out, out shoot me, Mr. Dollar. And I'm known as one of the best in these parts. Uh, who taught her? Well, Dane taught her himself. He figured the girl ought to be able to protect herself. So tell me something, Sheriff. Did she have any reason to think it might be a prowler? Have you have you had any trouble of that kind around town? Oh, three weeks ago, it was a house broke into over on the south side. And twice since then, Dan called me in the night to come out and take a look around his place. Oh, why? Well, seems Lou Ann thought she heard somebody trying to break in. And did you find anybody? Nope. Was Lou Ann alone in the house the night of the shooting? Well, Mary Jackson was there. Who, uh... Well, she'd been housekeeper for the Parker for the last 15 years. Uh-huh. What's her version? Same as I told you. She heard the shots, saw the lights in the hall come on, and heard Lou Ann scream, Father! How did the girl and her father get along? Well, it couldn't have been any closer. She pretty broke up about it. Uh, you talked to her yet, Miss Dollar? No, not you. No, I didn't think so. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I mean, if you had, you wouldn't be asking a lot of these questions. Or at least you wouldn't be asking them in the way that you are. What way, Sheriff? Well, like you figured the Parker girl was actually guilty of something. Well, she did pull the trigger, didn't she? And with sufficient reason. She was nervous. She'd heard prowlers around before, or at least thought she did, which adds up the same thing. She thought she heard somebody break in. 
She knew she couldn't count on Mary for any help. She had a gun, knew how to use it, so she got up her courage and done an actual and normal thing. She used it. And she'll regret her mistake the rest of her life. Yeah. yeah that's the way the picture seems to work out. At the moment, at least. You got any reason to doubt it? I get paid to doubt things, Sheriff. Until I satisfy myself that there's no reason to doubt them. And that's all I'm trying to do. It's all the insurance company expects me to do. I'm not out to pin anything on this girl or to get out of paying her claim. Provided it's legitimate. It did. Well, then she's got nothing to worry about. If the thing happened as you just told me it did, then I have as much sympathy for her as you do. It'll be a pretty rough memory to live with. I just want to be sure, that's all. All right, Miss Dollar. You look around. You talk to people. Ask any question you have a mind to, but you're going to come out right back where you started at. You're probably right. Dan and me have been friends for years. Good friends. Now, if I thought there was the slightest doubt about this, I would be the first one to kick up a fuss and go after the truth. Even if the evidence pointed toward Lou Ann Parker? No matter where it pointed to. Well, now, look, I want to talk to the housekeeper and to Miss Parker herself, and I'd like to attend the coroner's inquest, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. But you're a little late. Huh? It was hailed this morning. What was the verdict? Death by misadventure, unavoidable accident, with no recommendation for prosecution. I see. Would it be possible for me to see a copy of the transcript? It would. I'll ring the coroner and tell him to expect you. But let me give you a little piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. All right. Folks in these here parts love that girl. So when you start walking around asking questions, walk easy. <laughs> I went over the coroner's report and found nothing. Lou Ann had been called as a witness and appeared to have answered all questions in a frank and a straightforward manner. I checked her school record. She was regarded as an unusually bright girl and had stood at the head of a class all through high school. She'd been elected cheerleader in her junior year, won the lead in the class play, had been chosen queen of the senior prom. She was the town's darling. They worshipped her. And I could see that casting any aspersions on her would be like an attack on the crown jewels. I began to feel like a peeping Tom, like a louse, like I was wrong. And yet, qui bono? Who benefits? Two bullets in a man's heart and a hundred thousand dollar payoff. I had to be sure. Johnny Dollar. Tom Bates, Mr. Dollar. Tom... I'm acting county attorney since Dan Parker's death. Oh, yes. I was looking for you earlier. So Sheriff Peterson said. What was it you wanted to see me about? Didn't Peterson tell you why I'm in town? Yes, of course. You're an insurance investigator. You're here in connection with Parker's accident. Accident, did you say? I thought the sheriff straightened you out on that. He tried his best. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you any Mr. Bates, are you in your office at the moment? Yes, I am. Stay there, then. I'll be right over. Item four, five cents for a copy of the Green Pass Weekly Sentinel. I glanced through it as I walked across the square from the hotel of the courthouse. The big news, of course, was the tragic death of longtime county attorney Dan Parker. And two columns of the editorial page were devoted to eulogy and sympathy for the dead man's adopted daughter, Luann, who had mistaken her father for a prowler and shot him to death with his own gun. But neither the editorial nor the front page mentioned the fact that Luann, because of her mistake, stood to collect $100,000 worth of insurance. Are you Tom Bates? That's right. My name is Dollar. I just talked to you on the phone. And I told you I had nothing to say. Uh, mind if I sit down? Now, look here. You look, Mr. Bates. I've been in the business of insurance investigation for quite a while. And I probably know the legal rules and responsibilities of your office about as well as you do. Get out, Dollar. Uh, for two cents, that's exactly what I'd do. And if I did, you'd find yourself in a real tight spot. What are you talking about? The company would have a battery of high-powered legal eagles in town by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they'd have a subpoena, a restraining order, an order to show cause so quick it'd make your eyes bug out. And that's where it would start to get embarrassing, Mr. Bates. When you tried to explain to the court why you were withholding evidence and refusing to cooperate. What do you mean, refusing to cooperate? I haven't refused a thing. It sounded that way to me. I don't care how it sounded. I... Look, I know what you're up to. Peterson told me why you're here. Oh? You're out to muddy this thing up. You're trying to pin something on Miss Parker so you can get out of pay any insurance claim. And subpoena or no subpoena, you'll get no help from my office on a crooked deal like that. Any reason for you to think something could be pinned on her, Mr. Bates? Of course there's no reason. 
You saw the transcript of the coroner's inquiry, didn't you? I did. Well, did you find one single hint of suspicion anywhere in it? No, no. Not much of anything else, for that matter. Are you always as gentle with your witnesses as you were with Miss Parker? The girl was half out of her mind with grief. On the verge of a breakdown. We got the facts. What more do you want? Maybe we should have thrown her in jail. Beat her up with a rubber hose. Starved her till she thought of something to confess. Is that the way you'd have done it? Oh, relax, Mr. Bates. You're not in a courtroom. No, and by heaven, I'm not going to be. Not on this case. Because there's no reason. How long have you been in love with the Parker girl? Ever since I... What difference that make? It might help to account for your attitude about this. What is it you're thinking? That I'm helping her get away with something? Covering something up for her? Or that all of us are, maybe? Everybody at the inquest? <laughs> well, it wouldn't surprise me too much the way this whole town gets up on its high horse the minute you ask a simple question about the girl. Well, what do you expect? When you go around insinuating... Insinuating she... nothing, Mr. Bates. I haven't accused Miss Parker of a thing. I have no reason to. And regardless of what you think or Sheriff Peterson thinks, I didn't come here to frame her, to pin something on her. I want just one thing. The complete detailed story of Dan Parker's death. And I'm going to get it, one way or another. Well, nobody's trying to prevent you. I'm glad to hear it. Then how about some cooperation? What do you want to know? How long have you been Mr. Parker's assistant? Almost three years. And now you automatically become county attorney, is that it? Yes, until the next general election. Do you intend to run for the office at that time? Possibly. I don't see... How did you I... and Parker get along? Fine. Why? Well, did he approve of your interest in his daughter? Well, he certainly preferred me to... Well, anybody else in the running. Who else is in the running? Nobody, actually. Are you engaged to her? Not officially. She doesn't think she's quite ready to settle down. Uh-huh. But if she had been ready, you... You think Mr. Parker would have welcomed you as a son-in-law, huh? I think so. I didn't kill him, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Ever have any arguments with him? No. None of any importance. Who were his enemies, Mr. Bates? He didn't have any. A county attorney without a single enemy? That's a little remarkable, don't you think? That was the type of man he was. He'd usually let sleeping dogs lie. Easy going. Too much so, maybe. That was half the... Half the reason the two of you argued? Is that what you started to say? There were times when he should have gotten tough, or at least let me do it. Well, you'll have your chance now. And I'm going to take advantage of it. In one case, at least. Oh, what case is that? The Happy Hollow Roadhouse. That place should have been closed two years ago. Mr. Parker wouldn't hear of it. And the sheriff wouldn't touch it without Parker's okay. Who runs it? A dirty little... His name's Sammy Drake. A cheap 30-cent crook. Why should the place be closed, Mr. Bates? Because it's a menace to the community. Drake's got everything going out there, wide open. He ought to be run out of town. And before the month's up, he will be. Was Drake a friend of Mr. Parker's? <laughs> Hardly. Is Miss Parker acquainted with him? She knows him, of course. In a town this small, everybody knows everybody else. Doesn't mean anything. I see. You see what? What are you driving at, anyway? The complete detailed story, that's all. Fine. But what bearing does this stuff have on the story? Oh, none, probably. The sheriff tells me Miss Parker is a dead shot with a pistol. Do you know if that's true? Yeah, absolutely. She can outshoot me any day of the week, along with most of the other men in the county. That's one of the tragic... One of the ironies of the thing. It was her own father who taught her to shoot. Was she given a paraffin test the night of the accident to determine whether she'd fired a gun? Of course not. In the first place, we're not set up for it. And in the second place, there was no doubt but what she had. The housekeeper heard the shots and ran out in the hall and saw her standing there with a gun in her hand... And she admits she fired him. What more do you want? I guess that ought to satisfy any reasonable person. Well, thanks a lot for your cooperation, Mr. Bates. You're welcome. I'll frankly admit I don't have the slightest idea what line of thought it is you're trying to follow. It's the same one I've been following ever since I left Hartford. Do you know the Latin phrase, qui bono? Sure. Means who benefits. It was an old principle of Roman law. And it's still a good one. Who benefits here? Well, Luann Parker, of course, to the tune of $100,000. But maybe she's not the only one. There are different ways of benefiting, you know. It still comes back to the same thing. She's the one who mistook her father for Prowler that night. She's the one who pulled the trigger and fired the shots that killed him. Apparently so. But it's possible that somebody might have used her, Mr. Bates. <laughs>
Expense account item five, six dollars even. Flat rate payment to Jake Deagley for a couple of hours' use of his battered old taxi. I stopped at the telephone office and I talked with the supervisor. I talked with the editor of the local paper and with a waitress who'd gone to school with Luann Parker. With a boy in a service station who dated her in high school. And all of their remarks fit the same picture. A sweet, fresh, all-American girl. With an adored father who'd showered her with gifts and attention. And now her own personal tragedy was the town's public one. And they all wept for her. Not a fact out of line. So finally I decided I'd filled in the background enough for the moment, and it was high time I met the little princess face to face. Yes, sir? Good afternoon. I'd like to see Miss Parker, please. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but she ain't here. Oh? She's been staying in with Dr. Praley and his wife. Seems like she just couldn't face this place after what happened here. Are you the housekeeper, Mary Jackson? That's right, sir. Well, I'd like to talk to you too, Mary, if you don't mind. What about, sir? Just a routine question or two. I'm with the insurance company that carries the policy on Mr. Parker's life. Well, I don't think I ought to go around talking. Well, it's quite about... all right. Sheriff Peterson and Tom Bates are both cooperating with me, so you can be sure there's nothing wrong about it. Well, if them two say it's all right. They do. Then I reckon it is. Won't you come in, sir? In a few minutes' conversation, I learned that Mary Jackson had practically raised the Parker girl and worshipped both her and her father. She showed me the terrace where Dan Parker had bumped into the chair and wakened both his daughter and Mary. The back door where he'd entered the house that night. And then finally the main stairway where the shooting had taken place. When I heard the shots, all I could think was, oh, my poor baby, and I come running out in the hall. Hmm. Your room is the third door there, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, just then Miss Lou Ann turned on the lights, that switch right there beside you, and I saw her standing here at the top of the stairs with a gun in her hand. Then we both looked. Saw it was Mr. Parker. We run down there. Miss Luann tore off his tie and pulled his shirt open. But he'd already passed on. Yeah, it must have been a terrible thing for both of you. Yes, sir. It was. Mr. Parker seems to have been a very generous man, especially with his daughter. Oh, he always give her anything she wanted. Bought her another new car just last month. Yeah, I saw it in the driveway. Well, this is a very attractive house. Must be worth twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Mr. Parker bought it just two years ago. He thought with Miss Lou Ann growing up, she ought to have a better place to live. What's your salary here, Mary? Ninety-five a month, sir. And my keep, of course. <laughs> I wonder how he did it. Sir? Well, Dan Parker made $5,000 a year as county attorney. There's less than six hundred in his bank account. The manager said it's never been much higher. And yet... This house, new cars, those clothes of Miss Parker's that you showed me, a $50,000 life insurance policy. How about that, Mary? I don't know nothing about it, sir. And still, with all this, they were always quarreling. How'd you find that out? Why, Mary? What did they quarrel about? Well, it, it's only been the last six months, and it wasn't her fault. It wasn't like her. It was that Sammy that put those ideas in her head. Sammy Drake, the fellow who owns the Happy Hollow? She was a restless one with nothing to do, and he took advantage of it. Filled a head full of crazy notions. I know it was him. What crazy notions, Mary? Oh, going off to New York, getting on the stage, or dancing in some nightclub. It's the only thing Mr. Parker ever refused her. But he sure put his foot down on that. He said the only way she'd do it would be over... over his dead body. Oh, sir. Thanks, Mary. You've been a lot of help. Johnny Dollar. This is Tom Bates. Oh, how are you? Dr. Praley just called me, Mr. Dollar. He says you've been threatening him. Oh, I wouldn't call it a threat, Mr. Bates. I simply told him that if he won't let me question Miss Parker, then I'll have to get a court order to do it anyway. Well, as acting county attorney here, I think I could block that order, Mr. Dollar. Maybe, but I doubt if it would be a very smart move. Now, you look here. She's in no shape to answer questions. She's under doctor's care. It's been five days now since the shooting. She's still very upset, nervous. She might say things that could be misconstrued, that she didn't mean. Oh, what things? How would I know? I just thought you might. Since you've already questioned her once, right after she killed her father, wasn't she upset then? Did she say anything you misconstrued? I'm warning you, Dollar. And I'm warning you. I'm going to talk to that girl one way or another. <laughs> Item 8, $1. Transportation out to Sammy Drake's Happy Hollow Roadhouse on the highway north of town. On the way there, I thought over what I'd learned so far, and 
and I realized it wasn't much. On the face of it, the thing was simple enough, no mystery at all. Five nights ago, Dan Parker, the local county attorney, had returned from a business trip and entered his sleeping house. His adopted daughter, Luann, mistaking him for a prowler, had shot him to death in the darkness. There it was, an accident, pure and simple. The coroner said so, the sheriff agreed, and the whole town was determined to keep it that way. But I still couldn't buy it quite that easily. Not when there was a $100,000 life insurance policy payable to Luann Parker, the girl who'd pulled the trigger. Maybe I'd find some answers at the roadhouse. <laughs> the Happy Hollow was like a thousand other places of its kind. A neon-lighted barn set 50 yards off the road. Inside, a jukebox, a raucous bar, and a scattering of tables around a splintery dance floor. Saturday night's a four-piece band. Probably a game or two going on in the back room, and whatever else the local sports might demand. It was early yet, and the joint hadn't started to jump. What's the word, Max? Save your money and buy booze. Yeah, man. Out of town, huh? Depends on which town. Any town but this one, man. Here it's for the birds. Oh, I don't know. Looks to me like you got a good setup here. I'm eating. But it ain't easy, man. It's rough. Oh, it'll be rougher, Sammy, with a new county attorney. What's the pitch, Mitch? That's your name, isn't it? Sammy Drake? That's a crime, maybe? Oh, it might be. I don't know yet. You were the feds? No. Syndicate man? No, I'm an insurance investigator. Insurance? You mean protection? <laughs> Not the kind you're talking about, Sammy. I'm here in connection with Dan Parker's death. You mean you're legit? That's right. Well, tie me up and nail me off. I thought you were somebody putting a bite on me. I am. Yeah? Yeah. I got some questions, Sammy. And I want some answers. About that... How so? Somebody been passing the word? Maybe. Two get you five, it was that Bates character. Am I in? I couldn't say. <laughs> sure it was. The new county attorney. He's got a big deal now. And he'd give his left eyeball to put the finger on me. Why so? Why has he got it in for you, Sammy? Because he thinks his doll has been... You mean the Parker girl? I forget. You want to do it the hard way, Sammy? No speaking. I can get Tom Bates to wish you a warrant, you know. He'd love to have that chance. So you can either talk to me here and now, or you can talk to him and the sheriff in the basement of the courthouse. Rough and tough, huh? If that's what it takes, yes. Come on back to the office. All right. What'd you say your name was, Buzz? I didn't. It's Dollar, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, huh? Yeah, it rhymes with collar. I always like to be wise to who's putting the slug on me. Come on in. Thanks. How about a drink? No, uh, no, no, thanks. Well, I guess I'll have a short one for my health. You hungry? Like a steak? Later, maybe. They're the most. This is a crummy joint, strictly for the sticks. But the food's good. Yeah, here's a go. Yeah. Maybe you think I'm trying to stall. <laughs> I know you are, Sammy. No, no, not really. Not now, anyway. Because when I stop and think about it, I can't see where I got anything to worry about. You see what I mean? You haven't. Unless you had something to do with Dan Parker's death. Now, now, let's relax, Max. The, wor the way I get the word, nobody had anything to do with it except that doll. Could be. Could be nothing. Did she blast him or didn't she? Apparently she did. Thought he was a burglar. <laughs> That's a rich one. And she's halfway right at that. Meaning? Look, Dollar, I'm on a level with you. If you got any idea that I wanted Dan Parker knocked off, you're way out there. You want to know why? I can probably, yes. I'll tell you why. He was my fix in this town. Three years I've had this place open, and I've never been touched. So why would I want to put myself out of business? Oh. How much was the payoff? Grand and a half a month. Maybe you figured you could make a better deal with somebody else. Yeah? Who? Not with that stuffed shirt Bates. He's just been itching to get at me. But Parker kept the lid on him. How about the sheriff? Who knows? I'm going to give him a pitch, of course. It's my only chance now to stay in business. But I don't know if he'll... Because he's got the drooling goose for that Parker kid. And he didn't like it much when she kept hanging around me. How'd you feel about it? You want the truth? I didn't like it much either. Why not? She was too wired up and spoiled. Used to get in her own way. Oh, this town's treated her like a queen or something. She figured she could do as she pleased. Well, I don't go in a joint like this. What do you mean? Well, these lads come in here, get a few shots under their belt. Dame like that starts to mean trouble. I didn't want her hanging around. I had a good thing going here, and I wasn't about to get it lost up. But it was no use. I couldn't keep her out. What did her father think about it? He didn't like the idea, but he couldn't do much about it. She got her own way with him, the same as with everybody else. Except when she wanted to go to New York. Well, nobody can win them all. 
I understand you put that idea in her head, Sammy. Then you better take a different understanding. Yeah? Yeah. She was bugged up on that idea before I ever met her. That's why she started coming in here. She wanted me to put her hep on how it was in the big, wild city. She wanted to know how to get in. What was the names of all the spots, including the rough ones? How the rackets worked. <laughs> how would I know how the rackets work? <laughs> I didn't say a word, Sammy. You know some? In some ways, that kid's as smart as a mink. But underneath, she's a regular hick, just like the rest of them around here. She thinks that stuff is glamour, the big time, hot stuff. And she was busting her braces to get at it. Even this place, this, this crummy clip joint. To her, it was wicked and exciting. Oh, man, how squirt can you get? I suppose you're trying to talk her out of going to New York. Do I look crazy or something? I was all for it, anywhere. As long as it got her off my neck. Oh, a beautiful girl like Lou Ann Parker on your neck and you were trying to shake her off? Oh, Sammy, I'm losing you. Oh, look, Dollar, when it comes to dames, I've got as fast an eye as the next guy. But with that chick, oh, man, I unpack my toothbrush and I stay home. Why? Why? She's got this whole town fooled, everybody but me. A sweet little thing in ruffled rompers, bucking for a halo. Well, I got news for you, brother. She ain't. And you're the only one who really knows her. Is that what you're claiming, Sammy? Sure. It's a big laugh. But that kid's smart. And inside, she's colder than a fish. I'm a fairly tough baby, Dollar, but I'll tell you something straight. I'm scared of that girl. Expense account item nine, $6.90. Steak and incidentals at the Happy Hollow Roadhouse. And Sammy Drake was right. The steak was good. Item 10, $1.75. Transportation onto the Green Pass Railroad Depot, three miles east of town. I tried to see that night station agent earlier in the day, but he was sleeping then. But it was nearly midnight now, and I figured he'd be on duty. He was. Good evening, sir. I... Hold it, son. Got a message come in here. Yes, sir. Old number eight's going to be right on time. I'm glad to hear it. I want to... Hold it, son. Got to answer it, you know. Mighty important business getting these here trains through. Yes, I imagine it is. I... Hold it! Yes, sir. Right on time. Be here in about two minutes now. Well, son, what's on your mind? I wondered if you were on duty the night Dan Parker got back in from Richmond. The night he was killed. Oh, yes, indeedy. I... Uh, you must be that fellow Sheriff Jim Peterson was telling me about. That fellow from the insurance company. Yes, that's right. Well, then I guess it's all right to talk to you. At least, why, that's what Jim said. Nice of him. It's a mighty terrible thing. A downright tragedy for that poor motherless girl. Making a mistake like that, shooting her own father. Yeah, rough deal. Did you notice Mr. Parker when he got off the train that night? Well, of course I did. I always notice anybody getting off. It's part of my job, son. Yeah, well, I, uh... It was right about this same time of night. He come in on number eight at the same one it's doing now. Did you talk with him? Of course I talked with him. I know Dan Parker since with both pups. <laughs> he said, he said, hi, Willie. And I said, fine. And he said, how's the family? And I said, fine. And he said, well, you know, we talked. We had to talk more, too, but then there's some fellow there. You hear that, son? She's uh, coming across the Briar Creek Bridge right now, right on time. Well, uh, look, what happened to this stranger? Did he and Dan Parker leave the station together? Oh, no. No, they just talked while the engine was taking on water. The fellow got back on the train before it pulled out. He's just going through. Did you hear what they were talking about? No, can't say that it did, son. Most likely didn't amount to nothing, though. No, I suppose not. By golly, I did hear one thing. Oh, it, what? Just when the train was starting up, the fellow leaned out and yelled, Thanks a lot, I'll be seeing you. Dan just grinned, waved back, went on down the platform to the telephone booth. You uh, don't know what he meant by that remark? Oh, nothing, more than likely. Just one of them things you say, you know. But that's life for you, because he won't be seeing him after all. See, she's coming around the bend there, son. I gotta get the mail sack out. You got any more questions? You, you're gonna have to ask him where to run. The mail's got to get through. Oh, I wouldn't think of stopping it. We talked to nobody, son. What do you mean? Well, he come back and said get a busy signal. I guess he'd have to walk home, and that's what he done. That was his mistake. That was one of them, anyway. And you got any more questions? I reckon they'll have to wait. I haven't got any more. How's that, son? I said thanks a lot. Well, what for? Well, there you got me. I don't know. Don't you give up, Dollar? Admit you're wrong. Wrong about what? About thinking you've got a chance of beating Miss Parker out of her insurance money. Oh, so that's what I'm trying to do, huh? That's what your company pays you for, isn't it? To find some angle, some technicality that they can use to break the claim? No, they pay me for the unpleasantness of having to put up with bullheaded acting county attorneys, Mr. Bates. Sure. You'd a lot rather question that girl without me being around. Bates, 
I'd rather do anything without you being around. Maybe you know more about it than you've admitted. Maybe you know she's guilty and are trying to cover up for her. I know she's innocent, sir. Or, uh, it's possible your motives are a little more selfish. Maybe she's covering up for you. What do you mean by that? <laughs> it's that old Latin phrase, qui bono, who benefits? Who gains through Parker's death? His daughter does, of course, she gets the insurance. But so do you, Bates. In what way? Well, you got Parker's job, didn't you? And along with it, the chance to run Sammy Drake out of town without Parker stopping you? And in the long run, if Luann marries you, you'll get a good part of the insurance. Are you accusing me of murder? No, just speculating. But it's an interesting possibility. Don't you think so? <laughs> Any particular subjects I should avoid, Mr. Bates? Ask anything you want, as long as I'm here to advise her. Oh, hello, Tom. Luann? This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company. How do you do, Miss Parker? Mr. Dollar, won't you come in? Thank you. I guess we'd better go in the study. Mary's clean in the living room. In here. Just sit down anywhere. How do you feel, Luann? Oh, I'm all right now. For a few days after it happened, I... I couldn't feel anything but horror, self-loathing. I wanted to kill myself. But the last two days, I've... Well, I've done a lot of thinking about what Daddy would say if he was still here. He was a wonderful man, Mr. Dollar. Yes, the whole town seems to agree on that. I'd give my life gladly to change what happened. But it can't be changed. Daddy used to say, Luann, remorse is only self-pity in disguise. The future is a question mark. All you have is the present, so live it. He believed in those ideas, Mr. Dollar. And I'm going to try to live my life by those beliefs. Because I loved him very much. <clears throat> uh, Miss Parker... I have a few things I'd like to ask you in order to complete my report. Do you feel up to answering some questions? Yes, of course. Whatever you wish. I insisted, Luann, that I be present during this interview. Why, Tom? His job is to save money for the insurance company. He'll try to trip you up, lead you into saying things you don't mean, things that could be misinterpreted. Tom, that's ridiculous. I've nothing to hide. Of course, hon. But he'll make it seem as if you do. I'd say you're making it seem that way, and for no more reason than just a silly kind of suspicion. Luann. Mr. Dollar, would you rather talk to me alone? I think it would work out a little better that way. Tom, it's been nice to see you. I'm not leaving. Yes, you are leaving. Right now. Honey, you don't... I said now. All right, Dollar. I guess you will. Phone me later, Tom. Sure, Luann. He's nice. He means well, but sometimes he can be an awful idiot. Oh, his actions are fairly normal for a man in love. Or one who thinks he's in love. It usually adds up to the same thing. Cigarette, Miss Parker? Oh, thank you. Well, what is it you'd like to know, Mr. Dollar? First, let me tell you a few things. I've talked to quite a number of people during the last two days. They all worship you. In fact, only one person in the whole town said anything against you. And he's a man whose word on anything would be a little questionable. Sammy Drake, I suppose. Yes. Well, I don't know what he said, but I imagine he thought he was being honest. You see, Sammy's never understood me at all, and I guess I have given him a kind of a bad time. How do you mean? By pretending to take him seriously. Most people seem to think of me as a child, Mr. Dollar, but actually in my attitudes and awareness, I'm quite a lot older than my age. Of course. And I saw right through Sammy the first time I met him. He's just a silly little would-be tough, but he likes to think of himself as a smooth, wicked mobster type. So I pretend to go along with it, even put on an act of my own in return. And what do you think happened? You had another Tom Bates situation on your hands. Sure. Sammy took me seriously. Well, I didn't want any part of that, so of course I ran for cover. And he has never forgiven me. Well, I guess you can stand having one detractor, Miss Parker. You've got a big team on your side. I like people. I guess that's why they usually like me. I've had a wonderful life, Mr. Dollar. And I'm very grateful, especially to Daddy. He did everything possible to make me happy. I think if I'd asked for the moon, he'd have tried to get it for me. There was one thing, though, that I understand you disagreed on. You mean my wanting to go to New York? That's right. I guess the only arguments we ever had was over that. If I'd only known how short a time he was going to be with me, I... Well, it didn't matter that much... I felt I was right that the only reason he was against the idea is because he still thought of me as a child. Parents usually do that. I know. And it just didn't matter enough to... to hurt him when he had so little time. But you can't go back. I wonder if you would try to go back for just a moment, Miss Parker, and tell me in your own words 
just what did happen that night. Well, Dad had gone to Richmond on business. None of us expected him back that night. All right, go on. Well, Mary, she's our housekeeper. She went to bed early. I read till about 11, then I went to bed. And shortly after midnight, something woke me, a noise down on the terrace. I looked down from my window, and I saw sort of a dark shape slip across the terrace toward the back of the house. I was scared stiff. I'd heard prowlers outside twice before during the past month. Yes, the sheriff told me you did. Yes, well, I realized it was up to me, because Mary would have just gone to pieces if I'd waked her. All I could think of was getting to the phone down at the bottom of the stairs. When I started out of my room, I could hear somebody fooling with the lock on the back door. And that's when I thought of the gun. Where was it? In the drawer of the night table beside my bed. Daddy'd put it there himself after the night I heard the prowler, but I'd almost forgotten it. All right. Then what did you do? Well, I took the gun. I went back out into the upstairs hall. All I had in mind even then was to go downstairs and get that phone... But when I reached the stairway, I heard someone moving down below, and I realized that whoever it was had already got in the house, but they were starting up the stairs. And I could see just a vague blur, dark shape against the shadows. I was petrified. I remember thinking he's probably got a gun. And w- without even stopping to consider, I fired twice down the stairs. Yes, Miss Parker? I heard him fall. I knew I'd hit him. Mary screamed, came running out of her room. I found the switch, I turned on the lights. And then I saw what I'd done. It was Daddy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Parker. And Adley tried to make a phone call from the railroad station that night, and he told the agent all he was getting was a busy signal. Could he have been trying to call here? I don't know. I didn't know about it. Would he be likely to call you, coming in unexpectedly that way? Oh, he'd be more likely to call Jake Digley. Jake runs a taxi service here. Yes, I met him. Well, he might have tried that. But Jake was out at Sammy's place that night. Well, the reason I say that is because Daddy would have known that our phone is usually off the hook at night. Was it off that night? I don't remember. Maybe Mary knows. One or the other of us was always taking it off because we had to go clear downstairs to answer it. Yes, Miss Luann. Oh, Mary, the night Daddy was killed, do you remember whether the phone was off the hook or not? Yes, Miss Luann, it was. I remember when I picked it up to phone the doctor. Well, I ain't sure if you left it off that night or I did, but it was off all right. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Well, Mr. Dollar, what other questions do you have? None, as a matter of fact. I did have several more, but you've already answered them indirectly. Thanks for cooperating. You're quite a girl, Miss Parker. Oh, yes, I'm quite a girl. A girl who killed her own father. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. I meant exactly what I said to her. One way or another, she was quite a girl. Either she was one of the sweetest, bravest, and most honest kids I'd ever met, or she was one of the smartest, coolest little murderesses who ever walked the face of the earth. And I was very much afraid that I'd never be quite sure which. Johnny Dollar. Jim Peterson, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hiya, Sheriff. I uh, understand you talked with Miss Parker this afternoon. That's right, I did. Well, what do you think now? I think I'm going back to Hartford the first thing in the morning. So you finally decided the girl is innocent. I don't know, Sheriff. And I probably never will know. I'm just finishing up my report now. I'll send you a copy of it. Well, I'll be mighty interested in seeing it. On the basis of my investigation, I'm sure the company will pay her claim without question whenever she's ready to file. I'm beat, hands down, and there's no use denying it. Well, you can't win every time, Mr. Dollar. It's not that, Sheriff. But this is the first time I've ever had to end a report with a question mark. And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the home office, Shorty Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Qui Bono matter. Expense account, final page. <laughs> Item 14, 50 cents. Notary fee on a 20-page report. A report that covered everything and told nothing. 
but it was the best I could do. I had no more leads, no new ideas. The bare facts of the case still stood. Dan Parker had returned unexpectedly from a trip, entered his darkened home late at night, and had been shot to death as a prowler by his daughter, Luann. Amount of insurance, $100,000. Beneficiary, Luann. I checked through a half a dozen theories and been forced to throw out every one of them. And the whole case finally came down to just one simple question. When Luann pulled that trigger and fired down the dark stairway, did she or did she not know that she was shooting at her father? I couldn't answer it. And I didn't believe anyone else would ever be able to. Except, of course, Luann herself. <laughs> Item 15, one dollar even. Transportation out to the Happy Hollow Roadhouse, where the steaks were good, the drinks were good, and a beaten-down guy could kill anything. Well, wrap me up and mail me south. Here's that dollar man again. How's it going, Sammy? Business gets any worse, so I'll open an artery. You here for kicks tonight, or are you going to put the arm on me again? Let joy reign unsuppressed. That's the word, man. That's the word. Come on over. I'll let you buy me a drink. You're riding on a swindle sheet. Oh, better yet, I'll let you buy me one. You own the joint. Okay, okay. Set us up, Joe. Make mine a usual fusel. What do you have, sir? Scotch on the rocks. You ever get through to that Parker chick? Yeah, I talked to her this afternoon. Well, what do you think, man? Was I right or was I right? About what? Is she a cool fool or not? I don't know, Sammy. She's a tough one to figure. She's just a tough one, period. Well, here's to the housekeeper's daughter. Yep. Ah, this stuff is murder. I don't know why the customers stand for it. So what comes next, Tex? I'm going back to Hartford in the morning. And little Cookie gets her payoff. A hundred G's. Man, it's really going for broke. If she is on the level, it's not enough to pay for the way she'll probably feel for the rest of her life. Teeny. You could be right. You I know I'm right. She's took you, man. She's took you good. Bang, bang, and the little lady wins a prize. Maybe so. A big, fat hundred G's. And bad old papa in cold, cold ground. Man, she was really shooting for new shoes that night. Well, if she was, she's got them, Sammy. There's nothing more I can do about it. So that's life. <laughs> what is it? You win a little, lose a little. Stick around, Dollar. The joint will be jumping. Fine. I can hardly wait. Uh, let's have another one here, bartender. Coming up. <laughs> uh, sir, would you give me the honor of having a little drink with me? <laughs> well, thanks. I'm having one with you. I've already got it. Well, so you have. So you have. <laughs> well, another little one never hurts, though. <laughs> Later, maybe. Thanks, anyway. Any time, friend. <laughs> What line you in? The insurance record. Insure? Well, well, that's all right, I guess. I... Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, bartender. Thank you very much. I'm in ladies ready to wear myself. Must be fascinating. A wholesaler. I work out of Baltimore. Cover three whole states. Oh, I've got a great little line of merchandise. <laughs> I uh, really don't need any. Oh, the heck with business. Let's live a little, shall we? <laughs> a Mr... Dollar. Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes. Well, he's looking at you, Dollar. Uh, you know... I always believe in living while I can, because you never know. Now, that's a very profound thought. No, sir, you just never do, because it can happen to anybody, just like it did to a fellow I met last week. Man right here in this town, too. A fellow named Parker. Parker? That's right, he was a fine chap. I met him on the train coming out from Richmond, and I was on my way to Roanoke. Oh, we were laughing and we were joking and everything, and that very night he got killed. I read about it in the paper. So you just don't never know. Hey, look, tell me something. Are you the man who got off the train with him, talked with him on the platform while the train was standing in the station? That's right, that's right. He wanted me to meet his daughter. And that's all he talked about. It was his daughter. Oh, he was crazy about that. Kid. Well, uh, did he expect her to be there at the station? Yes, but she wasn't. I, I guess they got the wires crossed. He tried to phone her, but he, he didn't have any luck. So I get back on the train. He walks off down the road. And a half hour later, he's dead. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you just never know. On the train, on the way down, what did he say about his daughter? Oh, oh you know, the way a guy talks about his kid. He, he worshipped her. Yes, he did. That's all. He, he was telling how they were always kidding each other. And they were... Oh, say, here, here, take a look at this tie I'm wearing. Yeah, sure, it's a nice tie. Sure, it's a nice tie. That's what anybody would think, just to look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice... Come on, come on. I want to show you something about this tie. Well, they... can't you show me without going No, out? you got to go outside, so come on, come on. <laughs> uh, Mr. Parker gave me this tie. He was wearing one on the train, and I liked it, so he gave me one. He said he had three of them. His daughter gave them to him the week before. He got them from some novelty house. <laughs> so come on, come on. Well, look, uh, what is it you want to show me about it? Well, come on, come on. we got to go down there at the corner of the building. 
Oh, boy, this will knock you out. No, I'm telling you, oh, it's just real crazy. Yeah, it must be. Parker never would have given it to me, except he had three of them. He figured he could never wear them all, so... Well, uh, well, come on, let's see the trick. All right, all right. Look, it's just a nice necktie, isn't it? That's all. Yeah, that's it. Nothing out of the ordinary. Now, come on around the corner here, out of the light. Oh, boy, this is going to fracture you. <laughs> now, now, look. Well, I'll be... Good Lord. How about that, eh? Is it crazy? That daughter of Parker's really must be something. It glows in the dark. Good evening, Miss Parker. Well, Mr. Dollar, what are you doing out here this time of night? Mind if I come in? Please do. Thanks. Oh, I brought your gun back. The sheriff was finished with it. I never want to see it again. How do you feel? I'll put it uh, here on the table. You'd better not leave it there, though. It's loaded. I wish Sheriff Peterson had kept it. Oh, it may come in handy sometime. Again. Mr. Dollar. I was planning to leave town in the morning, Miss Parker. I'd already made out my report and given you a clean bill of health. Well, I didn't even realize I was under suspicion. What was I supposed to have done, Mr. Dollar? Deliberately murdered your father in order to collect $100,000 in life insurance. You've got a pretty horrible mind, haven't you? Maybe, but I wouldn't trade it for yours. Haven't you noticed my necktie, Miss Parker? I thought you'd tag it the first thing. Why should I? Because it belonged to your father. A special gift from his loving daughter. He gave it to a man he met on the train, and I bought it for $10 this evening. So now you know what happened to the third tie. That's probably been bothering you. Because I imagine you carefully destroyed the other two. I think you're a little more than slightly insane. Oh, it was a neat plan. Simple and sweet. You got the idea a month ago when the sheriff caught a prowler over on the south side of town. And when he came back from that trip, you got your chance. You've got quite an imagination. Oh, it was a great setup. A dark house and him wearing a tie that glowed in the dark, just unforeseen accident. Your father talked to a stranger and gave him a tie. And that tie is going to hang you. No, I don't think so, Mr. Dollar. Turn on those lights. Well, right, you know, it is a perfect target. You were very clever, Mr. Dollar. But not quite clever enough for you to know. Sheriff! Yeah, I've been standing out there on the terrace. You? No, no, Luann. You better give me the gun. No use pointing it, honey. It's loaded with blanks. You all right, Miss Dollar? Yeah, I'm all right, Sheriff. A little sick, that's all. But anybody so beautiful could be so rotten. You faked it. You tricked up the whole thing just to frame me, you filth. You dare to eat That's enough, Luann. No. That's enough. Nobody tricked you except yourself. That's yeah, hard for me to believe. Dan and me used to take you fishing with us when you wasn't no, no higher than that. You was the prettiest little thing I think I'd ever oh, seen. Oh, shut up, you old fool. Now I got to take you someplace again. Wish I had never lived to see this day. And I'm mighty glad that Dan ain't here to see it. Come on, honey. We better get started. Expense account item 16, $148.30. Hotel and incidentals and green pass and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $382.65. End of account, end of report. Remarks. When you gave me this assignment, Don, you asked a question. A phrase in Latin. Qui bono? Who benefits? So here's your answer. Nobody. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were D.J. Thompson, Mary Jane Croft, Forrest Lewis, Byron Kane, Russell Thorson, Sam Edwards, Dal McKinnon, and Howard McNear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Boy, I tell you, of all the episodes, all the multi-parters that Johnny Dollar did back in the 1950s, that is one of my favorites, the qui bono matter. Who benefits? 
Howard McNear, of course, there at the end. Sammy Edwards and that great bartender part he played. Byron Kane, not only playing the insurance agent who put him on the job, but also another character. Did you catch that one? The taxi driver. I think that was Byron Kane also. But anyway, a great cast and happy to bring it to you. Wish the sound quality could have been a little better. And there you have it. We're focusing in on Johnny Dollar, one of the great detective series of all time. Thanks for joining me, and come back again right here on YouTube.